Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our NEC SB8000 series in the block webinar. Um, as you guys most should know that the series is going in the block in December 31st of this year. And we wanted to get a webinar together so that you could review, you know, the, the risk involved with operating one of those in the block systems and what your move forward options are. I am Rebecca Selby, Marketing Manager here at Optus, and our presenter today will be um, Shane Lerma. A few housekeeping items before we get started is I'll be looking for questions in the question section during um, the presentation. So if you can see that, it will most likely be on the right hand um, part of your screen. Just type, type a question and we'll stop and answer those questions as needed. If you have any questions after the presentation or after the webinar, feel free to email us at info at um, Those go directly to me and I will get um, an answer for you or send, send you to the appropriate person. And one last thing is if you look in the handout section, we have three presentations there that go uh, more in depth on your different uh, migration options. So a migration into 9100, 93, and 9500. With that being said, I'll pass it to Shane Lerma, who will be our presenter today. Hey, thanks everyone for their time today. Um, you know, we've talked in the past about NEC uh, end of life at a general level and some just general end of life uh, uh, webinars. But today we're going to take a little bit deeper dive into the NEC products in particular. And, you know, we'll kind of review some of those key points of, of end of life, but we'll also take that deeper dive, talk about the migrations for the SB8000 to SB9000 products, and even cover some very specific items, new features and all that are in those products. So those product lines will kind of include the NEC SB9100, the NEC SB9300, and uh, finally the NEC SB9500 as well. So uh, feel free to ask questions along the way. Uh, we'll get started here. We can just kind of kick off by, you know, an end of life review. Uh, you know, end of life is really just the uh, indicating that product is the end of its useful life as far as the vendor is concerned, which really means the, uh, you know, the risk that we need to evaluate from them when they stop selling or marketing those products or start working on those, uh, those particular products. Um, so what that means to us, though, that's the important part because uh, what, what does it mean when it hits end of life? What are my risks? And we'll cover all of those today. So some of the big things, and if you've attended some webinars in the past, you know, end of life. So for the NEC SB8000 product, that's all of December of this year. So December 31st, 2018, no more uh, SB8000 products from NEC. That means you can get no new licenses. And that's whether that's a, an IP endpoint license or a contact center agent or port capacity, uh, you know, those would no longer be available because those are solely provided by NEC uh, at that point. Um, then there's no manufacturer support. So although companies like Optus can uh, continue to support you, uh, there's that lack of uh, safety net, if you will, from the manufacturer. Uh, now that doesn't mean we can't still take care of some day-to-day -day things, but you know, for a mission critical system or anything of that nature, uh, no manufacturer support is something to definitely consider in your risk assessment. Um, no new hardware or software. So we talked about licenses, but the hardware is not going to be manufactured anymore. Um, from the manufacturer in the software, and the software can pose several risks, uh, you know, that we'll talk about a little bit more in depth. Uh, but do remember that, you know, there is some hardware available on the secondary market, and Optus is one of those groups that can provide, you know, if you need a new phone or if you need uh, certain cards or hardware after that December 31st date, we can help with that. Uh, although I must uh, kind of caution, there are some concerns still yet because many of those pieces of hardware still require licenses as well. As uh, products evolve uh, today, whether it's NEC or any company, uh, so much of that is license-based today. So just be aware of that. Again, we'll talk a little bit more in detail. But uh, let's, let's take a look and see what those risks are real quick. Um, so risk of an end-of-life product. Uh, of course, you've got loss of service. And, you know, that just means that your system can go down. And, and what happens if it goes down? What, what does that cost you? What kind of problems does that cause? Um, and then the speed of getting that system back up. So the, the loss of service can oftentimes be the, the biggest risk uh, of any kind of end-of-life system. Uh, loss of expansion is another one as well. So what that can really be is if you've got an existing system 
and then you uh, say you're at a hospital and you're trying to add a you know new wing of the hospital new new clinic or something like that you may not be able to buy licenses uh, or you won't be able to buy licenses for that same platform uh, anymore after that date so you know even though you may be able to get phones or something like that just not being able to buy any kind of licenses can cause some issues when you try to expand your system. You know, third there, we talk about security concerns. So with no manufacture of software uh, after that date, you know, any kind of known issues will not be resolved because they're resolving that with the new product line. Uh, any current bugs or anything of that uh, nature, you know, and in today's environment, we know what security uh, issues can cause in a software environment. You know, that can leave a a hole out there that we don't want to have uh, available to anyone. And though all, any, although NEC does a great job, I think, of uh, handling those security concerns, once that product becomes uh, a little bit more aged, uh, you know, they're going to stop developing those bug fixes and security patches for those products. And uh, then the fourth thing there we talk about is stagnant features. So, you know, if you're looking for something new in your phone system, and, and you know, this is happens every day and it happens in a more retail or commercial individual environment as well, not just commercial, is, uh, you know, everyone wants the latest iPhone, everyone wants the latest Android, because there's always new features that are out there. You know, it's, it's always the next killer app, if you will. Um, but in the business world, you know, things like SIP trunks, which are definitely getting better in the newer platforms, more mobility options, different applications and integrations that may not have been available in the previous product lines. Uh, you know, if you don't expand, you know, you kind of eliminate some of those uh, new features that may help your business provide an ROI, make your customer uh, service more efficient, et cetera. So just being aware of that stagnant feature set, uh, what's available out there, and you know, as your company grows and continues to evolve, you know, what you take uh, a part of there. And uh, I guess across the bottom there is, is something that very important I don't want to neglect as well. And it really says as time goes on, risk increase. So, you know, availability of hardware and knowledge and support decreases. So that's, that's very true. You know, the expertise of support, people don't continue to maintain old products. Uh, you know, the hardware becomes more and more rare, you know, as time goes on. And uh, really what the only thing that increases is, is, is the risk of failure, you know, or of the system, because, you know, as those components age, uh, any kind of electronics, you know, they eventually have a failure point. They've been turned on off too many times, you know, just uh, cracked in the, the boards, whatever it would be just that more time increases that risk of failure. And uh, I know in the technology war world, and for those of you who uh, transitioned back in the day, I'll say uh, if, if you're my age, went from DOS to Windows. And, uh, you know, I think the first, first version of Windows came out in 1985, uh, but it didn't really become popular to about uh, Windows version 3.1, which came out in 1992. Um, although Windows 3.1, you know, it, it was uh, the most widespread Windows at the time, uh, was very popular. It didn't go end of life to 2001. But, you know, if you were to try to get someone to work on a Windows 3.1 system today, you wouldn't be able to find anyone. You know, there's very few people that are going to do anything on that or even know how to use it, much less support it, you know, the security concerns. So any kind of software, PBX, um, anything of that nature is the same way. As that time ages, uh, you know, the, that risk just increases. So just be aware of that. And, uh, you know, even if your system is already end of life or been end of life for a while, uh, that only you know, heightens the attention you should be paying to it to make sure that that gets replaced uh, before the risk gets too great. So let's look at uh, how to mitigate those risks before we get into some more specifics about the uh, various new NEC systems themselves. So there's really three options uh, you can look at to mitigate any of the risks we just talked about. You know, one of those is, of course, do nothing. Uh, of course, the downside of that is that carries the most risk. Uh, doing nothing, uh, you know, you've just got to be sure you understand the cost of an unexpected outage. What does it cost your business in loss of business or financial gain uh, when you're not able to answer the phone, when your communication systems go down, or, your, or the applications, the contact center that your business depends on? Uh, so just understanding that amount and, you know, in lost business and then realizing that, you know, if you're doing it in an unprepared situation where you're trying to get it back af after a system crashes, it typically takes a lot longer than if you prepare for that eventuality and have everything together. Um, and of course, in mission critical systems too, you know, you've got to be careful of liability. You know, if you're in a school district or, or education, healthcare, you know, there's a lot of uh, problems going on today. You know, having 911 alerts and things like that, that kind of help uh, work. But, you know, if you're in a situation where your phone doesn't work when someone dials 911, it can be uh, 
to be pretty rough. So just making sure that you've covered your liability too, because that's a, a scary thing, um, both from the loss of uh, any kind of life or, or property, as, as well as just, you know, to the business itself. Um, so that, again, doing nothing, uh, probably not the best option, of course. It carries the most risk. Uh, but let's look at the second option there, full replacement. And of course, you know, the flip side of that, it's the least risk available. Uh, the risk is very minor that you have there. You know, it's really just transitioning from one product to another, maybe training some new people, making sure you dispose of the new equipment uh, readily. But, you know, full replacement or an upgrade uh, to, you know, the, the next migrated product is the least amount of risk that you're going to uh, ensure. But, you know, and the Optus was really kind of built on prolonging the life cycle of some systems. So we know that not everyone can do that. You know, budget may not allow, uh, or for whatever reasons, you may not be able to migrate as the uh, manufacturer uh, wants you to or as they end of life a product. So we've kind of tossed in that option number three there, which, you know, uh, we've lovingly called somewhere in between. But, you know, some good things you can do if you can't migrate. Uh, you, you always want to eliminate your risk as much as possible, which is number two. But if you just absolutely can't do that for whatever reason, uh, at least take some of the steps outlined in number three here to upgrade to the latest available software. You know, maybe it's not a full migration to the new SV9500 product, but make sure your SV8500 is, is at the latest software release that you can get because, again, they're not going to be manufactured anymore. Uh, uh, the new software is not going to be manufactured after December. So make sure you get on that latest version. Uh, making sure you have crash kits, and that can just be, you know, hardware that uh, for common cards, especially in the larger systems that you have, you know, maybe a, a digital station card or analog station card or maybe, a, you know, a, a PRI card, power supplies, whatever some of those common components are. And at Optus, we can kind of help you identify that. We work with a lot of hardware, and we can tell you pretty much uh, with some certainty what some of the most common failure, uh, commonly failed components are for your particular system. So just understanding what you've got and, you know, if you're not migrating, making sure you have some of that hardware available. You know, third thing on the list there, regular backups. Uh, if you do have a system outage or you have to replace the CPU, even if you have one in a crash kit, making sure you've got all your latest configuration backed up. Because if you don't, you know, you're looking at keying that in from scratch. So uh, even more pertinent if you're, you know, you're not migrating to the latest version, you want to make sure that you've got good backups of your existing uh, database so that you can put that back in in case of a hardware outage, um, if you do have the hardware. And, you know, uh, you know, the best practices there, of course, you know, it's always good to keep some off-site as well, uh, just in case, you know, maybe one local. Uh, sometimes I'm a little paranoid. I'll keep backups in a couple different places, but, you know, that's also saved me several times in the past where I've seen some of my uh, uh, other uh, other fellows, you know, suffer because, you know, they had one backup, but something was wrong with that one. You know, this fourth item, too, is pretty important, you know, buying additional licenses and hardware. So even though it is going into support, uh, you know, you do have till December to buy additional items. So we talked about like a healthcare organization maybe adding a new wing to a, a hospital. You know, if you're looking at doing that, maybe you know in second quarter of 2019, you know, you're planning to add another 100 beds to, you know, your hospital. So making sure you buy the 8,500 licenses ahead of time uh, and you have those because you can get the hardware later, um, but at least getting the licenses, which you cannot get, um, and then making sure there's going to be some secondary hardware availability, which, you know, much more likely, but uh, definitely the software, buying those up front, any kind of port capacity, IP licenses, if your contact center is going to expand, buying you know, three or four more contact center agents, even if you don't think anything's going to expand, how many times has you know, something happened that you didn't expect? If you don't plan to migrate your system, I would say that's one of the most important things you can do uh, before that date is make sure you buy some of those licenses to have those available. Uh, you know, even if, uh, well, I'm planning to do something else and you know, 2019, 2020, don't take the risk. The licenses can be pretty cheap. Even if they go by the wayside or you don't use them, uh, you're in much better shape than not having those to begin with. Because otherwise, you know, you try to add something and you're looking at it, either a full replacement or putting in a disparate system, neither of which would be a, a good solution at all. So, you know, buying additional licenses, I call it kind of future-proofing, just to make sure that you're getting taken care of anything you know and anything unexpected until you can migrate that system. And, you know, the, the next to last item there, maintenance or warranty. If, uh, if you are on an end-of-life system, uh, you know, companies like Optus will, you know, also warranty or maintain that system even though it is end-of-life. So, you know, we'll stop crash kits for you. We'll make sure we have hardware that's applicable, you know, the latest software versions, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, 
we'll take care of any kind of break fix uh, issues you have uh, in that end of lifetime. Um, so, you know, a maintenance or warranty option is something else to consider. There's still the risk of no manufacturer support, uh, but, you know, companies like us and others, you know, will have, you know, resources you can utilize either from an inventory hardware perspective, the knowledge skill set to continue to support it, or, you know, even the software of, of some of the latest revisions. So just keep that in mind as well. Um, and then, you know, the bug fixes, any kind of bug fix security patches, make sure you, uh, again, if you're not migrating, get the latest ones available, make sure you've got your system patched as far as it can, kind of back to the upgrade at the top, you know, uh, apply all the latest software that you can to your current system. Uh, so, you know, you can extend the life as, as far as possible there. So again, just uh, just some good options there. Uh, of course, you know, here at Office, we'd love to sell you a new system. We know that's not always feasible. Let us know. We're glad to help you with item number three as well. Uh, we know not everyone can do item number, uh, you know, choice number two, but uh, at least do do something. Don't do number one unless, uh, you know, you're just glutton for punishment. Because if you're like me, you know, that's when something happens. You know, the day one after that, you, you'll have an issue and, and, you know, your boss is asking you why we didn't mitigate this risk up front. So that's just kind of a review of some of the end of life stuff we've talked about in the past. But we're talking specifically today also about the NEC products and what the new products are. So there's a, again, as I mentioned earlier, three products we'll kind of talk about today. The 8100 product uh, from NEC is migrating to the 9100, and then 83 to 9300, and of course 85 to 9500. I love how the numbers line up there. But uh, we'll talk about each of those three platforms, kind of what's changed in those platforms. Uh, kind of alluding to the uh, one of the items we talked about before those uh, those feature sets because one of these features may be something you're looking at uh, that you'd like to add to your system and you know so other than just migrating because of an end of life situation uh, you can take advantage of some of the uh, the new features or, or uh, improved hardware feature set etc in these products. So just looking at the 9100 and these are just a sampling of uh, of some of the new items. As Rebecca mentioned earlier, there are three downloads available out there that cover these in much more detail. So they'll show, uh, there's a presentation, I think, on the 91, 93, 95. They've each got their own presentation, several pages that kind of detail this out more. If you have additional questions, download those. Those are a great resource. Or give us a call. We're glad to, uh, you know, go into more detail with you as well. Um, but kind of four categories here, and we'll kind of hit bigger first. Uh, you know, expanded port capacity. So this system is, is larger than 8,100 uh, would, would uh, handle. It'll go up to like 896 stations now or 400 trunks. You know, so that's a pretty sizable increase uh, from the 8,100 as well. Uh, the NetLink nodes, which is really the remote site, uh, now you can go up to a whopping 50 remote sites on the 9,100. So, you know, if you have multiple locations, uh, clinics or different school campuses, et cetera, the 9,100 will fit uh, a lot more footprints than the 8100 would have in the past. So, you know, things are getting bigger. Uh, they're also getting better, which is number two. And better is important because it's hard to stress in a, in a, in a presentation sometimes, but a lot of the uh, things you'll see listed here in better are applications. And, you know, all applications are not created equal because you see a lot of different phone systems. And, and uh, you know, if, if you're looking at, you know, we, we sell different products ourselves here. But, you know, whether it's Navai or Cisco or uh, Mitel or, or whatever, you know, applications are not always created equal. But you'll find that a lot of companies have similar applications. They may all have UC, but it may be different uh, uh, quite a bit from application to application. Um, and, you know, NEC's had these out. NEC's been doing, uh, you know, telephone and applications for longer than just about anybody. Um, you know, Avaya is probably a close second. But other than that, you know, it's it's a far cry for, for the newer guys that are playing. So they really understand customer needs and they've built nuances into a lot of the applications that you don't really consider. So, you know, just because you have reporting, you know, looking from product to product, knowing that that reporting is easy to use, you know, takes care of what you need is pretty important. I mean, uh, it, it's like coffee. You can go buy coffee anywhere and everybody has their favorite, but you know, most people don't go to say Taco Bell to buy coffee uh, just because <laughs> they serve it, not the favorite coffee. My, my wife likes caribou. I've got friends that swear by Dunkin' Donuts, other people like Starbucks, but, you know, just like that, the applications are definitely uh, quite a bit different from product to product. I won't go into detail on all of those, uh, but just a lot of new UC enhancement. Uh, the contact center has more alerts, better integration, better reporting. Um, you get some stuff like the in-control call reporting, which is browser-based now. So you a lot more flexible being browser-based and 
having to have uh, you know a server with applications and everything else that you would have had to have in the past. Better video conferencing uh, as well, with like 32 conference ports, and even in the SMB system. And of course, things like faster, you know, faster CPUs, uh, some better applications with like fraud prevention. You know, regretfully, you know, fraud prevention is something that's pretty prevalent in our industry today, with either people hacking into the system, dialing out long distance numbers for whatever reason. Uh, but something like the in fraud guard, or in guard, I should say will uh, you know, determine like if you've made 50 calls from a single station uh, in an hour, it may send out an alert to you. It allows you to more easily block numbers, uh, things like that. So the in-guard protection can really help uh, with fraud. Um, things like that phone pro make it a lot easier for users to administer their system in their own phone. Uh, better PMS integration than, than uh, NEC has always been known for the PMS integration. I think uh, NEC and MyTail both do a good job of that. NEC has really jumped on board here lately. Been a lot of uh, research and focus on the hospitality industry. Uh, you know whether the hot sauce integration and our specific apps uh, for the front desk uh, uh, folks to handle that. Lots of good PMS stuff that's coming uh, down the pipe and that's already in the system. You know flexibility. You know MVPM blades. Everybody can do IP phones uh, hanging out there, but this kind of centralizes and can add you know more security than just the IP phone going out over the internet. Uh, it can make it more secure. You know, I think they can handle up to 100 uh, different uh, VPNs on there. So a lot of uh, options you can do with the MVPN blade. The newest telephones uh, have a lot of functionality there. Um, outbound caller ID uh, selection, you know, if, you know, it's hard to say good things about telemarketers, right, because we all get those calls. But this is one of those tools that allows them to change that phone number to whatever they want. Sometimes it's great in collections, you know, because if uh, people owe you money, they don't want always answer your phone number there. So uh, Changing that outbound caller ID as long as the carrier supports it's a great, uh, great new feature. And more SIP trunk enhancements with more flexibility, allowing more carriers, et cetera. <coughs> so, excuse me. But 9100, lots of good new features there. And again, some of those might be, uh, be worthwhile for you guys. The great thing to remember about all the NEC products we're talking about today is uh, none of these are forklift migrations. So with the 81 to 9100 migration, you're actually able to use like your station and trunk cards that you've already purchased in your 8100. Uh, oftentimes your chassis, things like that, may just be a new CPU or some other key components that get replaced. Uh, you may have to buy some new licenses in some cases. Those may be discounted though. So uh, regardless though, it's not like a full investment that you have to look at for that type of migration. You get to reuse a lot of your investment already. Uh, Maybe even including phones in many cases as well, which we'll kind of look at in more detail later. But taking a look at the 9300, we'll look at some of the new enhancements there. So again, we've got the same bigger up there. You know, in the 8300, one real challenge that we had, and I know other uh, people did as well, was the number of SIP trunks that were supported in the system. Uh, I think it was even marketed maybe one time at 100 SIP trunks. It would really only do 96. But now you can do up to, I think, 512 SIP trunks on the 9300. And you can do that across 64 carriers, and that can be carriers or different integrations, to different products that you have as well. So, you know, SIP being a relatively newer technology, they've definitely expanded the integrations, expanded the support for that, and uh, that makes it a lot easier with the 9300 platform. Uh, back to applications, you know, kind of the better. Uh, you see a lot of simplified license structure, and we saw this again in all three product lines the 91, 93, 95. Instead of making License is confusing on adding on different modules. They they simplified it in most cases. You know, in the 9300, there's a basic, there's a standard, a standard plus, and a premium. And you know that gets you anything from IP phone to a phone with you know applications for UC to maybe adding a soft phone and the stand uh, the standard plus to full blown collaboration everything in the premium. So didn't go into a lot of detail here. You can see that in the uh, the extra collateral that Rebecca has out there for you in the download section. But just know it's, it's a lot easier to handle those applications and kind of do role-based uh, uh, users as opposed to all the different licenses that were out there before. Um, you know, things like the increased mobility too. Uh, just you can bring multiple devices more than you could in the past to a single ring. Uh, makes it even easier to revert back to the corporate voicemail if you're using mobility. Uh, moving calls between devices, all that stuff's becoming more seamless. Again, it's just better coffee. It's, it's the Caribou coffee and not the Taco Bell or whatever brand you prefer. Um, key market 
uh, support. We talked about hospitality already, lots of great strides there. They were already a leader in hospitality, uh, but they continue to add new features uh, across that. And, you know, the airport kit, uh, this is for, uh, you know, regretfully, the most horrible name ever is in the in industry, lots of times people call that cra a crash phone system. You know, so that makes me a little uncomfortable at the airport. But, you know, it, it's basically, you know, the control towers, they do a drop-down call. So if airports are a market that you're interested in as a as a reseller, if that's, you know, your business, uh, just know that NEC does a great job of those airport kits. And we'll try to call them that instead of crash phone systems because that just scares me. I fly too much for that. Um, but the user web portals, uh, that, again, just makes it easier for people to administer things, make changes, uh, all of that good stuff that we talked about before. Uh, faster CPUs, you know, more memory, you know, things that you would expect in new revisions also there as well. Things like those built-in VRS speech channels, that allows you to do like uh, 16 channels. You can do two-minute recording. You know, that can be kind of almost marketing and hold messaging that's now built into the system. So you can, you know, have a variety of uh, hold messages, uh, marketing messages, whatever. If you ever put someone on hold or want them to listen to a message of some sort, a lot of that is built into the system now. Um, the flexibility, we talked about investment protection. Again, that's pretty much across the board because just like the 9100, you can reuse the, uh, the, the stations, the trunks, cards, the chassis, and even more migrates forward on your licenses. On the 9300, most of your licenses migrate forward at you know, just a single transition license fee, which is very economical. So you don't lose your license investment or your hardware investment. Oftentimes, it's very, very economical to take an 8300 to a 9300 system. Uh, and definitely worth talking about. If you've not talked to someone about that migration, you've got an 8300 today. I'd strongly urge you to do that because uh, I don't know how many customers have been surprised by, oh wow, I was expecting more. <laughs> so, so it's a, it's, it's good to know, especially before the end of life actually hits as well. Hey, uh, Shane, we've got one question. Yes. Yeah. From Jason, he says, I'm looking at a 9300 migration. Uh, what would I need to do to get started? To, to see a quote. Okay. So, yeah, if you've got an 8300 system today, I mean, the, the easiest thing, we'll, we'll hit this at the end of the call, just give us a call um, and we can kind of help walk you through that. But really, there's a few pieces of information. The uh, 8000 products, really great to have reports that can pull system information. So, it can be as easy as uh, one of our technicians dialing in remotely, pulling that system information, and then maybe asking you, you know, how many and what model phones you have uh, or any kind of third party peripherals you may have attached to the system. That's really it. Uh, and again, we pull most of that remotely from your system. Um, and that'll kind of tell us what's in there and kind of help you uh, migrate forward as well. But again, the most important step, just give us a call and we'll walk you through that. It, it's pretty easy, uh, quick and painless to, to make that happen. Good question. And, th and that'll be the same, quite honestly, for most of the products. The 9100, we can pull uh, that fairly easily remotely as well. 9500, or sorry, eight, 8,500, we can pull most of that remotely. Um, those systems are typically more complex and have a lot more peripherals too, though. Oftentimes, we may want to, you know, just visit. Uh, we're often glad to do that at no cost, just to kind of see your see your system, see your environment, make sure we're not missing anything, especially on those larger enterprise systems like an 8,500. But in all cases, those are pretty easy, require the same information, which is just, the, you know, the hardware that's in the system, the licensing, and then any kind of peripherals or phones you might have on top of that. And, uh, We'll talk about phones again. I, I think I mentioned that earlier, but uh, just looking at what will work, what won't work, because that's the great thing about NEC. Oftentimes, in addition to the cards and hardware, the phones uh, will migrate forward depending on what model you have. You know, sometimes you know they uh, allow phones to move forward so much. You know, at some point they have to kind of draw the line, like these are no longer supported. But we'll we'll give you a little bit more example of that in a minute. A uh, great question there, though. So um, you know. Multiple caller ID enhancements where, you know, you can get caller ID straight to your mobile device and things that you may not have been able to in the past. Um, but again, the 9300, uh, quite a few different uh, features that you did not have available on the 8300. So look at the 9500 real quick. And, uh, you know, we talk about simplified. That's kind of back to that simplified license structure. Same structure as the 9300, you know, the basic to the premium user and uh, just picking the user that you need as opposed to the all the a la carte options, and uh, they're building that in in most of the platforms now, so that makes it a little bit easier to, to deploy, to utilize uh, uh, in your environment. One big new thing, though, that they have is a second bullet point under Simplified is there's three deployment types now. And traditionally, NEC has 
uh, manufactured a lot of uh, appliance-based, we're calling systems, and that's really purpose-built hardware, you know, that's made specifically for, like, their platforms. That's the way the 8500 was. You've got, you know, CPUs, power, time division, all that kind of stuff is kind of built into purpose-built hardware, uh, you know, that was kind of NEC proprietary, though, if you will. So with the 9500, there's a couple of other migration types, uh, a couple of other deployment types you have. One of those is a software-only solution. So you can uh, have your own servers, and then, the, you know, depending if there's any TDM in your environment, there may be some gateways, but, you know, you can deploy that directly into your own server farm. We can provide the specs for that, what the requirements are, things of that nature. And, you know, that way, if you've got that environment set up already, you're ready to go. If you put it in your virtual environment and, uh, you know, it's really just software licensing and then any kind of gateways, telephones that you may need. Uh, the third option is really uh, similar, though. It's if you don't have your own virtualized environment, you know, AC is a, a, a server manufacturer as well. They make some of the best fault tolerant servers in the industry, and uh, they'll preload and pre-configure some of these servers uh, in a VMware environment so that one, one physical VM machine uh, may have multiple instances for your voicemail, for your PBX, for your applications, for, you know, your contact center, et cetera. And then uh, that makes it a lot simpler if you don't have your own VMware environment or your own server farm or, or whatever there. So those three deployment types are really nice. Um, they also build in a single point of management now. So uh, for those of you guys who have been around for a while in the NEC world, there was something called MA4000. And it was great. The only problem was you had to buy it. Uh, and it was not cheap. <laughs> and But it was a much easier way to administer your system than the natural PC Pro way or, you know, kind of the, the built-in free way that NEC had given you. Uh, but they just charged for it. In the 9500, they really realized, you know, how valuable that tool was. They built that into the 9500, so there's not additional cost or anything for that product. But it's called UC Manager now. But now that allows you to manage your, your, your PBX, your voicemail, you know, all that in one single point of management. And uh, you don't have to buy the licenses anymore. They're included with your 9500 migration, included in a new 9500 as well. So that was really a, a great move, I think, by NEC, because it was a much better tool than the uh, inherent one that, that they gave away. Uh, and uh, shows a lot of value to their customers, I think, as well. Um, improved business continuity. So we talked about the uh, different environments. You know, the appliance base could have dual CPUs, dual power, dual time division, but they were all at one location. Um, and there were some applications that, you know, allowed you some geographic diversity, but it was, it was very limited. With the new availability of a, a couple of different options, virtualized and geographic redundancy, um, you can really have, you know, a different server at a different location and have more flexibility, more redundancy than you ever had before. And, you know, NEC really took to the next level with this. And, and one reason the, uh, the server deployment has been so popular is because of that flexibility. Uh, whether you're working in a VMware high availability environment that NEC supports or you use kind of their proprietary geographic redundancy uh, applications and hardware as well, that can give you much more resiliency and redundancy than uh, was available in the past, and it was pretty strong in the past, quite honestly. So NEC has always been known for its reliability, and, you know, the redundancy is one reason uh, for that. So uh, they continue to improve on that. It continues to be uh, one of their strengths, I would say. Uh, investment protection, again, uh, much like the other systems, um, you can reuse a lot of stations, cards, trunks, things like that. Now it depends on the 9500. All the hardware for stations and trunks pretty much move forward on the 9193. 9500 has been doing that for a while, though, so it depends on the, the date of those cards, how old they are. For anyone who migrated from like a 2400 to an 8500, if you still have some of those old 2400 cards, they may not no longer be supported in the 9500. But uh, definitely, uh, in most designs that I've ran, usually I'm, I'm, I'm able to reuse 50% or more of that existing hardware, which again is a great investment protection. You don't have to replace everything. It's, it's not a forklift. I've had some where, you know, I replaced very little. I was able to reuse up to 90% of my equipment. Uh, I've had others that were migrated pretty old. So depending on that equipment, again, uh, that, you know, we replaced, you know, three quarters of the stuff out there. But Optus can help you with that. Uh, if uh, we can just get some information from your system, understand what you've got in that, um, we can tell you, you know, what that looks like. But there's a little bit more variety in the migrations in the 85 to 9500 than there are in the other two platforms for sure just because they've been letting people migrate cards in this platform uh, you know over the last couple of products as well 
Um, lots of good enhanced productivity. Uh, you know, unified communications the licenses are often included now in those uh, simplified user licenses we talked about before. Again, increases in hospitality, education, uh, all, all those places. Uh, you know, full functionality of the phones, which, you know, the, they make the newer model phones. The 9000 series support those phones, but the uh, 8000 can use them. They may just not get the full functionality. We'll see that on the slide here in a minute as well. Um, as, as always, NEC being an environmental company, too, they're trying to make things uh, safer for the environment, more uh, more energy efficient. I think the, uh, the latest cards they manufacture are 30% more efficient than the previous generation. Um, so they're a little bit smaller footprint size as well. Um, they've eliminated like the use of lead and mercury in their in their manufacturing process. So there's no you know unsafe materials in that in that process like a lot of manufacturers use today. Um, so they've made some great strides to be a lot more eco friendly uh, in this newest version of products as well. So that's uh, that's definitely important. I know we want the, uh, the the earth to be here for for our children and grandchildren as well. And I'm, I'm a strong believer in that, in taking care of that environment. So that's a, that's a lot of things uh, that, that we've discussed about the migration specifically. Just a, one more quick slide about the, uh, the phones because we've talked about those so much. Um, this is uh, just one matrix that we've got that shows what phones are supported on what product. It's a little bit busy when you first look at it, but this is a great tool to kind of help you understand if the phones you have today will migrate forward to a new platform. So for example, if you're using the uh, uh, DT820 phone or that series of lines, on your 8100 today, you can also see that it is supported on your 9100. Um, you can even see some things like the Series I phones are still compatible on the 9300 as well. Um, you know, those phones are getting pretty old. They're a few generations back. Uh, but NEC has built in functionality to allow those to move forward. So, you know, we have a lot of customers that, you know, budget doesn't allow for a full migration or, you know, they're not able to do that. So we've seen a lot of people migrate maybe the core platform, the brains, if you will, uh, in the back end and then come in with a phase two to replace the phones in the following year, uh, you know, as that budget allows. Um, this is again going to be available out online as well. So uh, feel free to, to look through this. If you have questions, we're here to help. Uh, give us a call and, and we'll be glad to help you with that as well. So that was really the uh, topics I kind of wanted to cover today. And uh, I'll kind of close with a couple options. Again, if you want more details, uh, I'll tell you how sad my life is. Uh, Rebecca and team have to pay people to talk to me. So, th so they're giving away a $50 Amazon gift card. If you've got an existing product and you want to look at the migration, you have questions, uh, not only is that free, we're actually paying you to do that. So feel free to sign up. There's a, a link below, and again, this will be available on Collateral as well. Uh, but you can schedule that, uh, that appointment whenever. It'll, just, it'll, it'll look at a, a calendar here for myself and the other engineers to make sure uh, we get some availability. We'll kind of help you out with that information that we need to collect if, if you're interested in moving forward. But love to talk to you. Again, definitely do something. Don't be the number one do nothing option because that'll get you in trouble at some point in the line. Uh, you know, when there's a system crash or something goes horribly wrong. So we either want to future proof your system at least to some degree or, you know, look at what the cost of migration would be. Again, I've been very surprised myself and I know a lot of our customers have been since you can reuse so much hardware and licensing. Uh, that oftentimes those migrations have been a lot more economical than people have anticipated. But uh, again, uh, let us know. Uh, glad to uh, glad to talk to you guys and help out uh, any way we can. Um, and I'll kind of stop for a minute and see if there were any more questions that popped up uh, before we close. Yeah, there was. Um, there's one question. It looks like from Richard. Will the UX 5000 terminals upgrade to the 9100? For that matter, will the UX 5000 system? Yeah, so there is a migration path for the UX5000 to the SB9100. Um, and there are some conditional things on the phones. I, I believe, and I'll, I'll have to double check this, we can follow up afterwards though, I believe the phones will migrate, but you can't usually mix and match. Like if you need to add new phones, the system wouldn't support the UX5000 phones and the SB product line phones as well. Uh, so if, if you were able to use all your phones and didn't need any new ones, I believe that's the case, I can confirm that. But if you do need to add new ones, um, it, it doesn't allow in a mixed environment. But we can definitely get you some more details on that and uh, help you out. But there's definitely a, a good migration path to take it to the 9100 platform. Let me see. It looks like that is the... Oh, oh uh, Beth asked if we can send out the presentation. 
Yes, Beth, we will do that. For everyone that attends after this, we'll, we'll download that, send you an email. Um, it may take us a, a, um, a day or two, but we'll also get you the recording. So I think that will help as well. There's one from, let's see, um, looks like from Kent. Is there a replacement for the 4L COT unit going forward on the 9500 series? Yeah, I don't think there's any four-port analog. Uh, well, and that may be the if that's for the MPC chassis, uh, there there is a lot of that's going to the UG50 though. So, and, and just to be clear, the the 4LCOT if that's for the uh, there were some small MPC chassis like a 1U chassis with remote uh, cards in those at a different location. Uh, they are still some options available there. There's like a single two-port option in MC2A that you could use a couple of. Um, the four port MPC though probably will be going uh, end of life soon if it hasn't already. Uh, but the the natural replacement for that from NEC's uh, perspective will be the UG50 chassis. So it really depends on the quantity you need. That UG50 is really a like a six slot chassis that you can put in you know any kind of TDM with its uh, analog stations, digital stations, etc. Definitely glad to uh, yeah MG4 CLT. So that would be the uh, the gateway box. Um, there are a couple options for that. Let us know and we can help you with those. The MC2A is only two port, or I'm sorry, that's for analog stations. The 4CO, you would have to do a UG50 uh, in, as long as there's not any stock of the 4LG, which I think is going into fly. The good thing would be we'd probably have some of those uh, analog trunk cards here at Optus, but they may be on the refurbished side now. So definitely just give us a call, follow up with that, uh, sir, and uh, we can help you out with that as well. Craig asks, what is the estimated time required to upgrade once we make a decision? In other words, what lead time is required to, for order to schedule an upgrade if we want to complete before November? Gotcha. So that's a tricky question for a couple of reasons. Uh, being the end of life uh, of these products, it's been a, a pretty busy year as far as things uh, getting installed from the service side. The hardware is pretty easy. Uh, we stock a lot of that. We stock more NEC equipment than, uh, than just anybody other than NEC. So oftentimes we have a lot of the equipment on hand. What we don't have, we can get uh, pretty quickly from NEC. And that can, you know, that's almost immediate. Uh, again, unless there's certain components uh, there. But 90% of that uh, hardware is uh, very easy. We like a 30-day turnaround in normal times just to make sure we're understanding your environment, understanding your configuration to make sure that we're, you know, during the migration, nothing's missed, especially the more complex environments. Of course, we've had down systems where we've done that, in, you know, over the weekend. Uh, but the only caveat I'll toss out there right now is it is end of life on NEC products. We've got a lot of customers that have that, but we want to make sure if you are interested in moving forward, probably talk to your sales rep or give give a, give me a call after this or, or contact us via the, uh, the information uh, Rebecca's providing. And uh, let's look at getting that scheduled because that'll be the only concern is, is the, just the volume of migration in, uh, in this year. I hope that answers your question. That was a long rambling question okay. answer, I think. <laughs> Kim, Kim asked, we're getting lots of good questions. Um, will Optus be offering any promos to migrate? Yeah, and NEC and, and Optus are both uh, being pretty aggressive with promotions. The current NEC promotions are valid through uh, September 30th. So, uh, you know, talking to your sales rep or getting in touch with us, uh, there's definitely some substantial promos. The other thing I'll toss out there, too, that I failed to mention is one of those promos, we talked about software assurance, um, and that's that recurring annual amount that, you know, some people have carried forward, some people haven't. Uh, typically, NEC has tied their promotions to a customer having software assurance. They've, uh, and if you if you drop the software assurance, there are usually penalties to, to, uh, to get that back in place. NEC has dropped any kind of penalties on obtaining software assurance, though, for the migration year here. So if you're looking to migrate and you don't have software assurance, uh, that's one good way to get some additional dollars off of your system. Because uh, in almost all cases I've seen, adding that software assurance more than offsets the, uh, it, it, the, the, promo, the promotions, I should say, more than offsets the cost of any software assurance. So just keep that in mind. But NEC and Optus both offering a really good discounts right now. And again, uh, most of those are valid through September. Uh, but, you know, the only concern, as I mentioned to the gentleman asking earlier, I'd just get that in sooner rather than later, especially if you're looking to migrate this, this year because, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's not Y2K by any means, but there, there are a lot of people uh, scurrying to make sure they get their systems updated this year. 
Gary's got a good question. Okay. I love this question. You're going to cringe. <laughs> what is the ballpark cost for going from an 8100 to a 9100? That's probably a hard question. <laughs> well, yes and no. Yeah. So it depends on a couple factors, Gary. Um, it's usually pretty economical. Um, the, the, the two variables uh, typically are, as far as the hardware, almost all that migrates forward. You're just buying a new CPU, maybe a new PAG card. What that translates to in dollars is just a, you know, a very low amount, maybe a couple thousand dollars or so. The two variables that can change that is uh, the type of phones you're using, if they're supported or not, and then any kind of licenses you have. Because on the 8100, you're going to get some credit to migrate licenses, but it's limited. Uh, so, you know, the more licenses you have is going to drive that cost up. But it can be, again, very economical in a basic system. And uh, let us know because we've really surprised a lot of people that I, I, we, we may should be charging more, I guess, you know. <laughs> but people are like, that's all it is to migrate. I've heard that more than once. But can be very low. Could, and I hate to give a number, but starting out, like, even as low as just a couple thousand dollars on a small system. Uh, to get that migrated. But, but let us know in your exact case. We can pull that bay based information remotely and we can give you an exact number for sure. Got one from Richard. On EEC software assurance, looks like some 8100s are covered past the December time frame. Is that right? Yes, yeah, so the only, the only software assurance coverage you could have past uh, December 31st, 2018 is NEC did allow you to sell multiple years of software assurance. They'd allow you to sell a one year, three year, five year option. If, uh, and, and that stopped a few years ago. So I guess uh, I'm just doing some quick math here. Five, back in 2015, there would have been an option to still buy five year software assurance from NEC on most platforms. If at that time you had elected to buy a five year software assurance contract, there are a, a few cases where the software assurance covered you until 2020. I will say there's been very few people I've run into that extended that, and of course NEC doesn't allow you to to uh, purchase that now. But back 2015 or before, if you'd bought a five-year contract, you know you could have went past the 2018 date. But again, very uh, very few people had elected to do so at that time, to my knowledge. Some good questions yeah. today. Yeah, looks like right now that's all we've got. Um, if I'm missing one. Feel free to type it in um, really quickly. I think that I'm reading over these again. I think we've gotten all these. And, and again, if you have questions today, I know in, in this environment, uh, some of those answers may be pretty high level. Yeah. If you've got a, a representative here at Optus, contact them or do the info at optusinc.com as well. Follow up that way and we can get in touch with you or give you a more detailed answer for your particular situation. Um, but I'll leave you with one very important fact for today. It is National Chocolate Ice Cream Day, so go out and treat yourself to a nice chocolate ice cream cone. Don't let down National Chocolate Ice Cream Day. It's a very important holiday to me and my family here, and uh, we want to pass that along to, to everyone else. <laughs> so, Rebecca, anything else before we close today? Um, just, you know, take us up on an offer to talk to our um, engineers uh, for free. Um, they'll do some, you know, question and answers with you, and... Um, give you a good consultation on your best for, um, paths moving forward. So take us up on that. Um, buy you something fun on Amazon for free on Optus. I wonder if Amazon ships ice cream. Uh, mm -hmm. They probably do in good cities. <laughs> Thank you so right, much guys. for attending. Thanks, Have everyone. Have a good day.